Aloha mai kako. My name is Taylor Chang and I serve as curator of film and performance at the Honolulu Museum of Art and the Doris Duke Theater. And it's my honor to be able to welcome you all to this virtual space, connecting us across various regions and, and communities. This is Carrying Culture, Voices of Solidarity, which is the third and final installment of this three-part poetry series that we kicked off earlier this year. And really it's been a culmination of ongoing conversations with Pacific Islands and Development Program, Dr. Mary Hattori, Tolua Samifua, our amazing moderator tonight. And you know, it, it is, these conversations you know, originated probably in like early 2019, maybe late 2018. And it's evolved and grown into this, into this beautiful uh, series that we were able to materialize in 2021, despite the pandemic, despite all of the challenges that we've been navigating as a city. So we just, so we just feel, so we just feel very, just feel very hold this space with you all. And we couldn't, you know, have concluded this this series in a better way um, with the poets and storytellers who we have with us. And um, it's, it's just really an honor for the museum to be part of this. And I just want to send a huge mahalo to Dr. Mary Hattori, Tulua Samifu, and everybody at the Pacific Islands and Development Program for, for working with us and, and just collaborating with us to make this, this possible. So mahalo nui for, for all of your hard work. And thank you so much to the poets and the storytellers in this space today. Um, just infinitely inspired by what you bring uh, to our community. And so thank you so much. Um, and it's my honor, it's my, it's, it is my ultimate honor to be able to introduce Tolua Samifua, our moderator this evening, who is the Community Engagement and Development Officer at Pacific Islands and Development Program. And she's gonna be uh, kicking off uh, the, the conversation today and introducing our, our guest speakers. So. Thank you so much, Tolua, for, for being here and holding down, holding down the fort of this conversation. Thank you, Taylor. Um, aloha mai kako, ta'alo falava, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful Saturday evening, early evening, as Taylor um, stated. I hope you all are well and have enjoyed your weekend so far. Again, I am Tolua Samifua, the Community Engagement and Development Officer here at the Pacific Islands Development Program at the East West Center. I'm so honored to moderate this incredibly special event tonight. And it is an honor to be alongside these inspiring and powerful poets who like me are especially touched by the topic for tonight's event. As a Samoan woman, although I was raised here in Hawaii and come from a very privileged background, I have faced moments of discrimination, which in turn taught me from a very young age, the debilitating effects of discrimination. While employed at the Oahu Intake Service Center in, the, in OCCC for five years, I immediately recognized the overwhelming discrimination against the Micronesian community by our local law enforcement and especially local me media news outlets. The narratives were familiar to what has been spun about Samoans, and these narratives were often headliners strategically used by media source outlets to sell a story while severely affecting an entire population of people. In Hawaii, Micronesians are one of the most discriminated groups, largely due to stereotypes about their low, low, lower economic status and heavier reliance on welfare. In today's event, we are proud to welcome four poets who would like to share their work and voices in raising awareness on the issue of discrimination against Micronesians in our communities, as well as standing in solidarity with our Micronesian brothers and sisters. I am so pleased to welcome our first poet, Ulamila Monica Tangivanua, is an I2K Indigenous Fijian woman, born and raised in Fiji with village ties to Ekita Yahweh in Kandavu and maternal links to Nasilai in Reva. She is a graduate student in the Center of Pacific Island Studies master's program in the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Her research interests include the study and creation of indigenous epistemologies as a framework for gender empowerment and tackling issues like gender-based violence and so on. Welcome, Ulamila. Uh, thank you, Tolua, for the, for the great introduction. Nisam uh, everyone, and aloha. Um, uh, today, 
just to kick things off, I wanted to um, share two poems um, that I hold dear to um, my heart. And the first one is titled um, My Mother's Dream. Uh, this poem was written as a tribute and homage to my uh, Fijian heritage, but it also in some ways talks about the roles and the dreams that I fulfill just being a daughter, a part of my Matangali or clan and an Ethiopian woman. Um, it speaks to the understanding of the undeniable pride I have um, and in turn we all should have of carrying our ancestors in our names and our existence. And for a woman, the pride is knowing that we carry future generations through our own being and our own work. Um, and so the poem goes, I am the dream of my forefathers and the prayers of my mother. I am the daughter of my Vanua and the Salu Salu of my Matangali. I stand firm on the land of my ancestors, confident in their wisdom, acknowledge, acknowledging their heartache, tears and strife, leaving out legacy throughout my life. I'm, I am in the marks that I leave behind in the hope that those who find it also come to realize that the answer has always been within. Um, it's one of my first poems that I wrote, and I also wanted to share a second poem um, I just wrote. Um, it's titled When Brown Women Write. Um, it's a response to Lani uh, Wen Kiang's work um, that focuses on the discrimination and everything that, that brown women go through um, when they write from own, their own perspective and their own point of view. And the poem goes, when brown women write, the words transcend the pages, the boundaries, the seemingly perpetual co-construction of societal norms, they confine, restrict, constrict. When brown women write, they do so with infinite care, because to care so deeply is to love, and to love is to fight, to push back, strengthen, and liberate to be as unrelenting as the white tree during the cyclone season, and to be as calm as a clear running stream nestled in the foothills of the Mauna, each powerful in its own stance. When brown women speak, their words from love letters live for generations. Their voices pierce through the facade created by colonialism, capitalism, and the denigration of our self-perception breaking chains that trap us in a mental prison ruled by deficit mindsets. When brown women speak, they bridge the past, present, and future, the spiritual and the physical. The existence pays hom homage to their lineage, those gone and those yet to come. Brown women sing, chant, write, rise up. Like Kumu Trask, her words, spears, storms of light, winds of hope. We are not American. We are not American. We are not American. Like Nana Tewa, motivated by love for Shenya, countering histories of pain and neglect, we sweat and cry salt water so we know that the ocean is really in our blood. Like Auntie Grace Mara Molisa, amazing grace, commanding yet gentle, fearless in confronting oppression, an unrelenting fighter for women's rights, salvation for the lost, justice for the oppressed, and freedom for the enslaved. Brown women dare, defy, exist. Like our teachers nows, brown heroes, healers of broken hearts, miracle workers in the kitchen, whose embers of Loloma still warm our memories, prayers protecting, powers flowing through, like you and I finding ourselves, ourselves in these pages, answering the whispers of our kupuna, looking through tear-filled eyes, recognizing, remembering, I am life, I am strength, I am my people. Naka. Mahalo Ulamila for your beautiful poems. We are so honored to have you here with us. Thank you so much for sharing those beautiful words. Um, I'm honored and excited to introduce our next poem, our next poet, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. R. Makuana Paia Aala Shizuko Hayashi Simpliciano, also known as Katana, is a hip hop ethnographer and educator. 
In the early 80s, while still in diapers, Katana began to dance and rap along with her brothers, who performed locally in the popping and locking break dancing crew called Ebony Express. As a teen, Katana became an award-winning female pioneer in Hawaii's spoken word and hip hop community. In the early 2000s, Katana was named as a distinguished Asian, Asian Pacific Island Gen Xer by Bamboo Ridge Press and was the 20,000 grand prize winner in the grueling 12 week long open mic contest sponsored by the Lion of Judah um, out of Zanzibar nightclub in Waikiki. I remember that. Katana's vocals and lyrical compositions have been featured on the albums of Big Every Time, which is BET, and the Ur Urban Island Hip Hop compilation, which was produced by the island music sensation Fiji. Katana has performed at the Steve Harvey Showcase, which is the Apollo of the West Coast in Los Angeles, California, and has opened up for the legendary hip hop group Public Enemy. Katana scored a recording deal with Kahoano Productions, and together with Kamuela Kahoano, wrote the album titled Kautika, which received the 2008 Hawaii Music Award for the category of spoken word and two New England Urban Hip Hop Awards. As a researcher and scholar, Dr. Hayashi Simpliciano uses performance ethno ethnography and hip hop to facilitate the creation of narratives in society. Welcome, I'm gonna include a, a link here of Dr. Uh, Hayashi Simpliciano's work so that you all can check it out because she's crazy inspiring. Um, and, but I would like to welcome Dr. Hayashi Simpliciano, also known as Katana. Mahalo Nui. Um, if you can't hear me, please jump in. I can't see you folks. Um, I'm going to be doing a quick presentation. Before I do, I just want to say in the languages of my ancestors, Aloha Mai Kako and Iran Karapte. Also, I want to just give a quick apology ahead of time to any elders that may be watching. I know that it's not the way of Oceania to use strong language in front of our elders, um, but my art is hip hop in slam poetry and we often use strong language to convey authentic feeling so i apologize ahead of time if any of my language or my tone is offensive to anybody like that little kanaka that i push from my womb hawaiian soul of george helm that they try to entomb like that hello anaka that they want to consume at their luau's in their hotels that we not welcome to i'm telling you Wahine Toa coming through. I'm repping the native stories, Kanaka Maoli, to the Ainu. So don't let them bind you, cousin. When they tell you give aloha, the only damn thing that they're giving to me in glitterant, they want to blow up, hold up. I can't believe what's on the TV. Calling elder six feet under, drunken Didi, walking freely. You tell me, when will enough be enough? Sick and tired of seeing Pacific Island youth in the cuffs. I remember Psycap, not another life snuffed. I'm saying fuck the policing when excessive aggression is on brown bodies. And you know that they were wrong the way they rode up on Lindani. Right to Mayor Blangiardi, tell him we're on a mission. We want Inocenta Sound Kiku to be running the police commission. So I'm going to um, be uh, trying to give as much information as I can very quickly. I know I don't want to go over my time and take up too much space, um, but I'm gonna be talking a little bit about uh, Japanese settlerism in terms of Micronesian hate, because as one of the largest ethnicities in Hawaii, Micronesian hate is not a Micronesian problem. This is our problem to deal with. Um, I'm going uh, to be talking about the Meiji era Im imperialism and how it's been internalized by the Nikkei diaspora. So it's extremely important that the Nikkei recognize that our answers, ancestors were indoctrinated into Confucian ideals in education called benevolent care. So benevolent care is the idea that indigenous children are barbaric and must be educated to assimilate to the colonial culture. So I have no intention of speaking on behalf of micro, the Micronesian experience with Japanese people. Um, I also know that some Nikkei will be watching this thinking, that's not me, I'm not Imperial, Imperial Japan. Um, but the point that I would like to drive home to any 
um, any Nikkei that may be watching today is that if you have had an ancestor who was in Japan during the Meiji Reformation, you have family that have, has been indoctrinated into this way of thinking about education. And in order to stop Micronesian hate, we really need to have critical conversations in our community about the way our histories with uh, Imperial Japan impact our bias. So because Ainu are so erased, we're often not thought of as being a part of Oceania, but Ainu are an Aboriginal people of the Pacific. Ainu and diaspora are appreciative of the Micronesian knowledge keepers that have helped us understand the sacredness of our tattoo practices, despite the fact that Japan has stigmatized our traditional markings as criminal. So just quickly, because I know pictures are worth a thousand words, um, here's a display of Pohnpei traditional markings, Okinawan traditional markings, and Ainu traditional markings. So we have artifacts from the Jamon period indicating a prehistoric tattoo culture, very similar to that of Melanesia and Micronesia. So again, here are traditional markings found in Yap. And very quickly, here are um, traditional markings that are being revived currently in Tokyo by artist um, Taku Oshima. What has always impressed me is that, um, you know, Fijian uh, women and Ainu women both have matriarchs or tattoo grandmothers. So in both cultures, these tattoos signified that a woman was ready for marriage, but there was also deeper meaning in both cultures, the tattoo grandmothers would seal prayers or incantations into the lip tattoo. And in pre-colonial times, girls were looked down on if they were without this tattoo. In Japan, the last living Ainu women who were tattooed were forced to wear masks out in public. So this is what our traditional Nuye or Anchipiri, depending on what dialect um, looked like on Ainu women. So my husband and children are lineal descendants of Kaihe, the Hanai son of Kahikili, who earned the honor of being tattooed black in the ways of Kahikili's Paele Kulani warriors. Kaihe would impress Kamehameha with his superior use of the spear. Kaihe's father, Teteki, was born in Nikunao, Kiribati. The family line goes back to a canoe builder, Ten Teteki, Te uh, Ten Teteki and his wife, Teruinane, who voyaged as a family from Nikunau to Kaupo on the island of Maui. So this passage about Kaihe as a lead warrior in Kahikili's army tells me that we did not have the divisions between oceanic people that we see today in modern Honolulu, where colonizers have manipulated an environment where Hawaiians see Micronesians as foreign. In reality, we're all intertwined in the complex genealogies of Moana Nuiakea. So the other thing that this also tells me is that Micronesians certainly have the technology to voyage from uh, and wayfind from the Micronesian I islands to the Japanese archipelago. Um, and within our DNA, we are finding now that testing is more prevalent, that um, the Nikkei diaspora has haplotypes um, of Oceania. So let's go back to this idea of benevolent care and what I call the Meiji lens on Pacifica. So pictured here is the late Dr. Yoshiko Sinoto of Bishop Museum, who was called the grandfather of Pacific knowledge, which just drives me insane. Um, we have to remember that in Angor Palau, Japanese is the official language. So almost immediately upon the colonization of Micronesia, Poor Japanese and Okinawans were encouraged to move to places like Palau to set up schools under the idea of benevolent care to teach Micronesians to become Japanese. We know that there was segregation of the children of Japanese nationals and Micronesian children and that Micronesians were actually taught to do um, labor. Um, so why is this important? Why am I showing you this picture of Dr. Sinoto? I'm showing you this picture because it's important to recognize that basically everything that we know about Oceania has been taught to us in formal institutions of education by either white men or Japanese men, right? So it's important um, 
to combat this gaze and combat the benevolent care if we are to come together as a, as a community. Um, as we're saying, stop Asian hate, we must be saying stop Micronesian hate. And also we must be dismantling as the Nikkei diaspora, the violent systems of education that our ancestors have put in place. So I have these questions here just to kind of throw out there to the audience. When Pacific Islander children are taught oceanic histories in Hawaii public schools, are they being taught a history constructed from the gaze of a Japanese anthropologist? Or are they, be, are they being taught authentic oceanic perspectives? Who are the educators guiding the policies and impl implementation of programs that impact mic Micronesian children in, in Hawaii? Is it Micronesians? How can we better support the normalization of Micronesian teachers and school administrators? So with that, I'm going to stop taking up so much space and make way for the next poet to come on board. Mahalo, mahalo, oh my gosh, so much, so many gems. Thank you so much, uh, Mapuana, for just, wow, blowing our minds with that amazing presentation. Um, I can't wait to hear more of the work that you're going to be sharing later in our segment, but just, wow, mahalo, mahalo for that. I know a lot of us were in the chat just going off on the chicken skin, um, you know, points that you're making, you know, for us and the re-education really that you're sharing with us here today. So we can't, I just can't wait to hear more, um, but mahalo for that. Um, I am, we're gonna just move on to our next po uh, poet for our third poet for this uh, event. I'm honored to introduce our third poet. Uh, Ms. Zaya Francesca Pangalinan Nauta is an indigenous Chamorro of Guahan of the Mar Marineris Islands. She came to Hawaii to understand how Kanaka Maoli are decolonizing themselves and to be an ally in the movements of cultural resurgence and food sovereignty. She currently works at Kako'o O'iwi in He'ia as a kalo farmer and is studying agroecology at UH Manoa. Welcome, Zaya. Hafede Toro Samzu, aloha mai kako. Um, Thank you for having me. And um, I, this is only my third time actually sharing my poetry, uh, my first time online. So um, please bear with me. But I, again, I'm inspired by um, the Native Hawaiians and all Pacific Islanders. But um, I moved to Hawaii to see how they are decolonizing themselves and try and be a part of it and also uh, bring some of that knowledge home with me where, and wherever I go to. So um, this poem that I wrote, I only have one poem. It's called, Our Islands Are Not Your Hotels. Um, I wrote it, I actually wrote it a few years ago. Um, I was on vacation with my uncle and we were watching TV in California and every other commercial was you know, Expedia.com telling everyone about cheap tickets to Hawaii and you can get shave ice and plastic lays. And it was just so frustrating and angering that that's what, you know, that's only California, but that's probably what's being shown across the continental US. And just that made me go down the rabbit hole of how everyone perceives us and uh, perceives us as in Oceania as a whole, because like, um, Katana said, we are all connected more than we realize and more than we like to remember. Um, so I was really mad at the tourists because I thought that tourism, tourism was the problem. But really, well, the more I thought about it and the more I wrote, tourism is just a form of the problem when the real problem is colonialism. And Colonialism, it takes that form, tourism and also militarism, which we are really experiencing heavily in the, in the Marianas right now um, from Okinawa, which is another connection that it's not we're, not, we're not proud of, but something that we have to share and stand in solidarity together. But um, colonialism also, I think the most prevalent and the most infectious form is a mindset that we are, you know, we are separate, we are different and things are, you know, if I'm, I'm better than them or they're better than, so it can affect our own people. And um, I think I wrote this poem to colonialism in all its ways, shape and forms. So I, I apologize if this makes you uncomfortable in any way, but um, I hope it's enlightening at least. 
<sighs> Our islands are not your hotels where you can stay and play for a few days. For you, we make everything nice, yet we pay the price so you can vacation your way. Your visits feed our economies, but we're starving ourselves. We're paving over our farms and buying food off of shelves. You swim in our beaches and you litter them with your trash, like your ignorant, arrogant attitudes, thinking our culture is worth cash because nothing to you is sacred. You adventure through our jungles like it's some kind of game, not respecting those who walked there first or the original name, blasting music and paces, eroding mountain faces, leaving traces for generations. When a few days isn't enough, you pack up all your stuff and you colonize our land with your greedy hands, pushing us down and out till we cannot stand, raising rent for a studio to over one grand because now supply is lower than demand. It's too low for demand. Now we're forced to work three jobs at a time. The unlucky and the angry resort to crime. We're selling our souls to make a dime because we can't afford life in our own islands. Too many native families your vacations forced out of the one simple island life you know nothing about. Now we're forced to navigate the globe to find a new home, a place the colonizer like you won't try to own. Though it seems like you're pushing us out of this dome, ahi, aole. You will not push out my people of the Pacific Sea. You will not take our islands as another commodity. We may be geographically far, but we look up to the stars and we know who we are. We are navigators and cultivators of the powerful Pacific Sea that voyage to the islands that are a part of me. Our islands are not your hotels. Our ancient songs are not your service bells. No matter how long you are here, we are now making it clear that our lands, cultures, and peoples are to be respected. Let me tell you how. Before your foot touches the ground from that plain, know the indigenous people and the indigenous name. Before you land, know your place where you stand on the indigenous people's land which was stolen. No matter what flags are flying over our nations, know that we have been here for hundreds of generations. Know that our people are scarred from fighting wars that aren't ours. Our lives are being bombarded, but we're still working harder so we can stay connected to our great grandmothers and fathers. Watch where you step and watch what you say. Know that you're walking along our ancestors' ways. There are spiritual guides watching night and day, protecting our past, present, and future. Know that the plants, birds, fish, coral, shells, and stones are the living cells that make up our island's bones. They're not meant to be played with, taken, or thrown. They're meant to be revered and left alone. The way they've been shaped, weathered, and grown, they're our ancestors. Be conscious and aware of the issues our peoples face, like being displaced for your military base. Know that this economy is not set up for us, that living means chasing paper that says, in God we trust. Our subsistence is smothered by the concrete dust, so we're fighting every day because we must. Know that our cultures are rising like the tides. We're feeding our children the truth and no more of your lies. Know that our languages are flowing like the breath of life and you can't cut our tongues with your colonial knife because after centuries of being your victims, we have grown thicker and stronger impenetrable skin. Know that we are warriors. We are warring with education, culture, language, and peace to kick you the fuck out or write your lease because our islands are not your hotels. Wow. Thank you so much, Zaya. That was, <laughs> I had to just take a minute, you know, process all that. So strong and incredibly beautiful. Sorry. One poem, but oh my gosh, it just <laughs> nailed it. I think um, a lot of us in the chat are going off. Um, it's very, very relevant to a lot of us here tonight um, tuning in. Thank you, Mahalo, so much for that. So incredibly beautiful. Um, you know, you, you're you saying this is the, what, the second or third time, you, fourth time you've shared it, but it's just rolling off so smooth and so passionate. Mahalo for that. It's so beautiful. Um, I just had to take a moment to kind of, you know, <laughs> uh, kind of let it sit for a little bit, but Mahalo for that. So beautiful. Thank you so much, Dea, for sharing your voice and being so brave and strong to do that. So 
we can't wait to hear more. We can't wait to see more. Um, but mahalo again for that. Thank you so much for sharing your voice. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, so thank you. We just want to move on to our final point of the evening. Um, very excited and honored to present none other than Punahele. Um, but Punahele is a country mole Hawaiian from Makaha, Hawaii, that stands against anything that is harmful to Aina. He is a hip hop practitioner that uses music to create a soundtrack to Hawaiian struggles and front lines. Punahele has been teaching community songwriting and poetry workshops to incarcerated and at-risk youth for over 10 years. The music he creates aims to build indigenous solidarity in Oceania and beyond. Punahele is a Giant Steps EWC fellow. Welcome Punahele. Aloha mai kako. How's everybody doing? Oh, I'm super stoked to be here. And right now I'm reading uh, what Kekai wrote in the chat. I agree, we do need to take a breath and breathers after that. In actuality, I think we should just drop the mic and let it end on that note. But uh, you know, I'm so inspired by my other panelists that I figure I might as well just step it up and just, you know, keep pushing forward for you guys. Um, this first song I'm gonna share, I wrote after seeing a painting by Herb Kane and um, and in this painting, there was an old blind man and he was getting dipped into the water. His face was covered. And the mo'olelo behind the painting was uh, the Samoan chief wanted to visit the greatest tattoo artist in the world. And you know, recently we hear about a lot of uh, pilikia between these two people. Uh, the Samoan chief went to the greatest tattoo artist in the world and that was Umbrada from Tonga. He got the tattoo and he decided for sale home, but there was blindsided by a super huge storm. And, you know, during the night, they had to just hold it out. And in a day, they never have stars for navigate. And it was just blown somewhere that they never did see and never did a visit before. So the Samoan chief asked everybody, whoever can help get us home, I'm gonna reward you guys greatly. And so this old blind man said, uh, dip me in the water and I like taste the water and then dip him in the water and he drink the salt water. And he said, oh, this water is super sweet. We stay in Fiji, chart the sails this way and we're going back home. And I think to me, the, the manao behind that was um, sometimes your heart can feel what your eyes cannot see and there's greater mana uh, out there for us, even though we cannot see them. So I wrote this song and never involved Hawaiians and Micronesians, but I figure I add to that rope of resistance and to that collar, to that braid, you know, our story. And our story as Hawaiians is we lost our tradition as navigators. So we had to go all the way to Sotawa, uh, check out a great man by the name of Papa Maupiaido. And he showed my people and helped us prove to the world that we were not just a bunch of lost savages who drifted from South America. And this is that song. Woo! Yeah. Gee. Yeah. Uh. Shine like the sun and flow like the stream. We rise like the tides in the sea. All the realms of them, if you believe, the heart can feel what the eyes can't see. Shine like the sun and flow like the stream. We rise like the tides in the sea. All the realms of that, if you believe, the heart can feel what the eyes can't see. We relearn navigation from our Micronesian cousins. We knew our vessels from the mast to the rudder with the stars in the night. We navigate the maze. The water that we drank was provided by the rain. Levocated to any high cow, bringing poor trees down, eat two mile mile. Cut across the water and the movements are swift. When crab claws grab a hold of the wind, shine like the sun and flow like the stream. We rise like the tides in the sea. 
Other realms are that if you believe The heart can feel what the eyes can see Shine like the sun and flow like the stream We rise like the tides in the sea Other realms are that if you believe The heart can feel what the eyes can see Rah. Yeah, and um you know, uh, as uh, Mapu and Zia said, sometimes in our art, uh, we use strong language. And, you know, we care if we, um, if we um, make people uncomfortable. But right now, I'm going to target a group that I don't care if I make them uncomfortable. I hope they feel uncomfortable because you guys make us feel uncomfortable all the time. And I wrote this song about um, a visit to Makua Valley. And... When I got there, a lot of the people that was with me grew up in Waianae and the Waianae Coast. And that's their ancestral homeland and they never did visit. And when they got there, we were super excited and we wanted to offer whole kupu. So we start getting ready to do the ceremony and the uh, military told us, oh, you Hawaiians cannot offer whole kupu, even if it means you guys are paying respect to your ancestors and this place because it's not on our military itinerary. And you know, a lot of the young kids who was there, I was like, oh no, we just, let's go home. And I was like, what? Like, we gotta do something. And of course, a couple 80, 90, 70 year old kupuna sat on the ground and said, we're not leaving to you letting us um, offer whole kupu. So this song is for Auntie Lynette Cruz, Uncle Sparky Rodriguez, and yeah other kupuna that was there. And this song makes people mad, but now they know how we feel, so. Woo! Yeah. Um. Yeah. Ma hope ma ko boli li ulani. Aloha Aina is my lifestyle and my hobby. Nine six seven nine two is where you'll find me. Proud Hawaiian got the lahui beside me. Ma hope ma ko boli li ulani. On top of the front lines is where you'll find me. Proud Hawaiian got the lahui beside me. Proud Hawaiian got the lahui beside me. We want Makua back, kick them colonizers out. Rest in peace to Pili Laau. He did what he had to win a tough situation, but no more will we bow to colonization. Settlers can resettle, meaning they can come and go. My people come from the Aina. This will always be our home. The land gets poisoned by their bombs and pesticides. It is hard to have a loki when our water's privatized. If the Aina is hurting and on its last breath, who will pack their bags and leave with no stress? If Oceania is hurting and on its last breath, who will stay here and clean up the mess? That's us. Mahope Mako Olili Ulan. Aloha Aina is my lifestyle and my hobby. 96792 is where you'll find me. Proud Hawaiian got the lahui beside me. Mahope Mako Olili Ulani. Aloha Aina is my lifestyle and my hobby. Building solidarity is where you'll find me. Proud Hawaiian got the lahui beside me. Shining light, twisters bezel in the source. I don't want Hawaiians fighting them white man's wars. Ain't no Viet Cong still land from Kanakas. Puna Helen, Mad Max, number one top shotter. Excess entitlement will leave your brain fried. The whole United States is illegally occupied. You'll probably never see another bad guy like me. I would give my life so West Papua could be free. Ah, Mahope Mako Olili Ulani. 
Aloha Aina is my lifestyle and my hobby. Spinning flames on all oppressors is where you'll find me. Proud Hawaiian got the Lahui beside me. Ma hope and ma po oli likulani. Aloha Aina is my lifestyle and my hobby. Building solidarity is where you'll find me. Proud Hawaiian got the Lahui beside me. They love Hawaii, but they don't like Hawaiians. They love Hawaii, but they don't like Hawaiians. Dang. They love Hawaii, but they don't like Hawaiians. If they love Hawaii, they better like Hawaiians, Micronesians, Black folks, LGBTQ plus folks, indigenous peoples all around the world. But they're going to catch cracks and feel the wrath. Thank you, guys. Mahalo, Punahele. Thank you so much. I love listening to your work. I get into it. I start bobbing my head. Reminds me of the days when I was going to the shows back then. And love to see the resurgence, man. Thank you so much for sharing. Mahalo, Punahele. As always, inspiring to hear you perform and share your words of wisdom and power. Mahalo to our poets for joining us and for opening us up with such beautiful and powerful demonstrations of aloha, mana, and friendship. We welcome you all and are so grateful for you all being here with us tonight. So we're just gonna move slightly forward. Just like you said, Punele, I was, I, let's just take a minute to like feel all the work that you all have shared in that first 45 minutes of our event. Just wow, so much mana, um, a lot to unpack and a lot to really sit and really feel, you know, these words that you all have shared so far are just inspiring. And this is what this whole thing is about, right? Using art for art as a way to express ourselves, to share our frustrations, our love and our aloha for our people and the people across Oceania and our Micronesian community here in Hawaii. Um, so I'd like to just open up the floor with some talking points um, that are of interest to myself and I know is relevant to all of us here. So I'll pass, I'll pose the point, keep it simple. And I'll just go in order of the way that we started with Ulamila, how everyone was introduced um, to kind of share, if you wanna share your response to this talking point as an answer, you can as a talking point. Um, but if also, if you wanna share it in the form of a poem or however you want, that's completely fine. So um, we'll start with Ulamila. Um, how, and this would be the same question for everyone as a talking point. How do you think poetry and or art can help educate or initiate conversations around post-colonization of indigenous people and the discrimination and violence against this um, indigenous people? Um, thank you, Tola. Um, I think just um, hearing that question, I would say, you know, I've always viewed poetry or any other form of creative writing and creative expression as an act of res resistance and resurgence, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think from the perspective of like, you know, Pacific Island people uh, mm -hmm. whose creative ways of being were stripped away, stripped and taken mm -hmm. away from them, like the art mm -hmm. of tattooing or being in the Fijian culture, um, mm -hmm. writing poetry, practicing tattooing, weaving, and any form of art is an act of reclamation. Right, reclaiming our voices in our own cultural spaces, taking back and also um, pushing back against post-colonial institutions that exist to oppress us. Uh, for me, it is a space to cultivate our own narratives, reframing against the ideals that seek to perpetuate alienation. Uh, mm -hmm. Poetry is special in that it, it speaks to people in different ways. Different people read and interpret the words in it in their own ways and using their own experiences. And I think it is a way of affirming agency when asking, what does this poem mean to you? Um, mm -hmm. Many great Pacific writers like Hanani K. Trask, Tercia Taiwa, Grace Mary Melissa, Albert Wendt, to name a few, um, expressed their thoughts and emotions through poetry. Um, and it is these emotions that inspire people, give light to the pain, trauma, and oppression that exists and I think that um, it, is, it is an extension of our own being, connecting uh -huh. us to our ancest ancestral forms of expression that was taken away and invoking us um, a solidarity and movement. Mahalo, Ulamila. That was beautiful. 
Um, thank you for so much for touching on those. I think, yes, I for myself growing up as a Samoan woman, um, I, there were so many issues, you know, I had growing up was I am a military brat. My dad was in the military. And uh, as I got older, understanding the role of the military played in the Pacific really shifted my narrative of what I grew up with, that whole military background and saluting the flag and being thankful. And although I'm grateful for the choices that my father made that really helped, you know, um, really, you know, take care of our family. As a Samoan family coming into the United States, you know, not my father not having a high school degree or a college background, this was the only way that he saw himself as, a, as, a, as an avenue to, su to support his family. And I am a benefit, I benefit much from that. I, and I understand that growing up, but, you know, porch and, but as I got older and started to understand my position as a Samoan woman in Hawaii, being on stolen land, um, understanding how the military played into that, that really, really was a, a huge moment of unpacking for me and still is. Poetry for me was a one way to even combat that identity of navigating as a Pacific Islander female, first of all, woman in this, in this society, and then understanding how I can factor into this community and how I can be of use to our community in a larger scale. So poetry for me has also kind of helped me navigate those difficult spaces. Um, but thank you so much for sharing that, Ulamila. I just, I forgot to share with everyone, if you do have questions that you want to pose to our poets, please utilize the chat function, uh, the Q&A function that we have available to everyone if you want to ask questions. That way we can hopefully get to questions later on in the segment. Uh, I forgot to share with that earlier. But uh, so moving forward to um, Katana, if I want to pose the same question, um, how do you feel poetry and art had, can help educate or initiate those conversations around post-colonization of indigenous people and the discrimination and violence against indigenous people. Mahalo, I'm gonna um, drop a quick verse and then talk about how that all kind of relates to me in my mind. So forget about what you heard from that kitty cartoon Moana about that OG original goddess Kanaka Celestial Mama before there was a voyage, before there even was a va'a. There was Haumea and her all-encompassing mana genealogy weaver, the seer of Anana, placed that way up in the stars so navigators could go where they want to. Kahei a Haumea, starlight web up there, said Wahine no can navigate, brought a peel back the layers. Haumea gave birth to our Pelehonua Mea, who sailed from Kahiki to her home in Kila, where Hina gave us the DNA to guide Wahine to the sea. Hina is the matriarch to spark our haplotype B. And for those who say in Wahine ain't been holova'a, what would the voyage be without the stars that Haumea did plot? Uh. So for me growing up, you know, as, as a youth, um, in this occupied place that can often be very, feel very violent. Um, it, I used hip hop as a way to just kind of reflect and decompress about what I was seeing growing up in um, Eva Beach in the 90s where methamphetamine was just rampant in my community, right? And so, you know, what I always tell people is that, but for another time, and place and culture, I may have been uh, trained formally as an orator by an elder in the Ainu culture or, or, or in our Kanaka Maoli culture, right? But in occupied, you know, neo-colonial Hawaii, right? I was without language, I was without culture. And so hip hop kind of became in poetry and words, hip hop be became that way for me to express myself. And then also restory um, our history in a way um, that could kind of challenge patriarchy and the status quo, right? So within that verse, I'm kind of pushing back on this um, suggestion that women cannot be voyagers, women cannot be wayfinders and providing my own analysis. Um, and unfortunately, I do it in uh, the colonial language and not the native language, right? But I feel like for myself in my art as a hip hop artist, as a slam poet, that's kind of that push and pull that I, I, I walk in um, where this process of oration, you know, this is an, a, an Aboriginal practice of the Pacific, right? Um, Kanaka Maoli did oration. Um, my Ainu people had, had what was called power talk, 
right, where they honored eloquence. Um, so I do that in the form of hip hop, in the form of spoken word. Um, and I try to restory the things that I'm hearing and seeing and re, um, resharing these, these histories from our past um, through poetry, through spoken word and through hip hop. Mahalo Katana, so much power, so much knowledge. Thank you so much for sharing that in the form of hip hop. I think for me growing up, listening to hip hop, I always loved, I loved the radio hits, you know, but I loved like the deeper, the deeper knowledge of hip hop artists that really put so much thought and knowledge into their verses. And so I really resonate with your work as well as Punahele. And um, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't call myself a hip hop head, but I love lyricism and I love how, yes, we're using the English language to um, to share our, not, you know, to share our mana and our frustrations, but way, the way it hits and that everyone can understand in that way, in that way, you know, it really just goes to show how much um, the creativity runs in our, in our knowledge, in our, in our mana, in our ancestors, although we're speaking in, yes, the English language, how much we can share and really um, educate not only Ocean, people of Oceania, but those of not, you know, from the outside of Oceania can really um, resonate with the, the words that you, I guess the work that you have and the knowledge that you have sharing that with us. So mahalo so much for that, uh, Katana. Can't wait to hear more. Um, but I'd like to share the same question with you, uh, Zaya. Um, how do you think, you, I mean, your poet, your, your poem that you did share really just kind of hit the, hit the nail on that. But how do you think your, how do you think poetry and or art help educate or initiate those conversations around post-colonization of indigenous people and the discrimination and violence against them. So it's that whole um, conversation is a really hard one to have, especially if you are a settler here and you are a, you know, your ancestors are those that colonized us. It's really hard and you know it's even hard for me within myself and with my within my own identity because I am my colonizer I am Spanish I am like over 12% Spanish still and you know. Um, and I'm still speaking English too, but I feel that like you know it's it's so hard to have but then when we try and address those things in art. And when we address it in things that are, you know, more a little bit more pleasing to the ear and get your head bobbing and get you moving. And it's, it's a lot easier to, it's, it's a lot gentler, I feel like, even though like the, the hip hop is like, you know, it can be really, and some of the words are really direct and really strong. The fact that it's, you know, hakud into a beautiful message that I think that makes it a lot easier to accept and to hear. Um, yeah, I think that's that's what I got to say. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that's exactly where, as far as like Mapuana and Punahele's um, form of poetry and activism, for me, it's the same. Like you're listening to something that catches your ear, right? And then you start to really resonate with the messages coming in through their their verses and it, it resonates and deep, hits deeper. And then you start to look at, you know, what else do they, what else are they writing? What else are, they, and then what other artists are out there that are doing similar work? And you, then you find people that, you know, maybe that are, you know, of your background that are doing the same work that you maybe you never would have even opened your, opened your mind to or your ears to. So definitely resonate with that, Zaya, as far as like the method in which art can introduce difficult conversation. Um, you know, I think even in my own space, it's just like how you shared, it's hard to have those conversations. And again, kind of re referencing my background as a, um, a child of the military, you know, having that conversation even with my own family members sometimes, you know, that are very patriotic to the, the U.S. And um, because they saw that as a way that they could have, you know, um, took care of their family. So they, you know, there's that guilt, right? And then there's that association with we wouldn't have been where we are without that, without the military back, the backing and all that. So having those conversations, even to this day, are difficult. And so sometimes sharing artwork, you know, I've shared poems with my father, I've shared um, video footage, like documentaries with my father to kind of open his mind as to, you know, even as a Samoan man, like you're still, 
your mindset is still controlled by that imperialist and colonization thinking, right? And so, yes, it's still difficult, but I feel over the years, been able to use, utilize poetry written by these amazing poets and writers from the Pacific to kind of expand the thinking of what's happened in the Pacific, you know, because of the military and because of the US, you know. So yeah, definitely resonate with that, Zaya. I think poetry for me, it was one way to kind of open up those difficult conversations. Yes, there's many still to be had <laughs> and not only family, friends, you know, but I think, yeah, I see poetry artwork as one way of massaging those difficult conversations into actually happening. So definitely resonate with that. Mahalo Zaya for sharing. Um, and then Punahele, same with you. Um, again, your work is inspiring. You've already, you are doing the work through um, poet, through your hip hop, uh, through your work, as well as my, uh, Katana. But can you share a little bit how you feel that um, poetry and art does help to initiate those conversations around colonization of indigenous people and discrimination and violence against them? Yeah, as well as um, poets and lyricists, we're alchemists, uh, we're mystic beings, we are magical. We have the power to uh, turn heaven into Pono and to write our ways out of uh, Pilau situations. And I'm super like honored and blessed to work with Sarah Fang and Taylor Chang. Uh, with an organization called Sound Shop. And um, I also volunteer and teach incarcerated youth at places like Haleho Malu. And I guess by giving them the opportunity and writing, giving people like us the opportunity of having writing prompts and writing all of our problems down and looking at it, now it's, it's not your problem. Like you get to look at it from a way that it's not your problem, it's not your trauma that you have to deal with. It's just trauma on a page or in the form of a song. And just by releasing it, it's healing. And I also took a food sovereignty class with uh, Kumu Kahala Johnson. And um, he talks about uh, the readings that he gave us, talks about the Rara Moody people in uh, Northern Mexico. And everybody kind of thinks that they sing songs because they're trying to party and celebrate the harvest, but they're singing songs to heal the land and to strengthen the community and everyone around them. And in the writing workshops that I teach, uh, we ask questions like, what in regards to your culture, what is the source of your wealth? And you know, uh, the same day we ask, uh, why are we racially profiled? And a session like this created a song like this. And I feel like Art is our best weapon. Music is our best weapon. People, it's hard to rebuttal a good poem uh, if you're not poetic. And most of our oppressors are not as blessed as us. Um, I was headed in a, towards a dark path as a kid when I was I Remembers and Starsky's age. And, you know, I was riding in stolen cars and I was taught, how do you say, negative things to survive. The, a lot of our mentors, in our in, impoverished communities, as Haunani says, Haunani Ketra says, where there's crime, there's poverty. They teach us how to shoplift. Like, let's go to sack and save. Cause when I was your age, I had to starve. And they teach us how to get food from these co colonial institutions and how to survive. And like, I'm not proud, but, um, and even though that's negative, they kind of, they did that because they cared about me. They didn't want me to starve. And yeah, music kind of helped me. And yeah, I'll stop babbling and I'll share the song. Woo! Yes. Uh. Sun sets in Hawaii, always got that golden glow. I rise early in the morning so I can hear the dawn patrol. All oh, gas, no brakes, no love for the fake state. My kukuna roamed around in red and yellow feather capes. Carry poo into battle, mouth full of dog's teeth. My heart still dreams of hee bite in the stream. Not afraid to get dirty, grow ulu and uwala. Because it's the return of the maka ai nana. Man is the servant and the aina is the chief. Me and music go to Together like the Vana and the Reef. Vibes so real that fake people can't handle. 
and we keep it lit like kukui nut land the shop as a razor blade rising like a mighty wave i just keep on pushing forward if they hate then let them hate i go hard every day because i don't like to waste let my sisters be respected free my brothers out the cage built to survive we always had that grit fight on because we wasn't made to quit faithful to the hood i can't switch the aina is the reason that i'm rich the lepo is the reason that i'm rich the moana is the reason that i'm rich i'm faithful to the hood i can't switch the ghetto is the reason that i'm rich i am the voice of the streets ascending through the fog a product of the slums young brown and pissed off the cops arrest her wives to serve private corporations i'm here to protect the ghetto from their gentrification my people don't want much we just want self-determination don't join the military learn hollow cultivation i use my words as weapons against native dispossession i'll gladly go to hell if there's no hawaiians in heaven i never said that i was perfect but recognize that i ain't fake i survived situations that made other people break kill them with aloha i don't spread hate hoki hoki aina is the way to make hawaii great and systemic oppression no surrender no retreat they killed i remember but and he could have been me my people fill the prison so i don't like the police arrest kupuna on the mountain while rapists run free so it's ftp acab 40 93 or i write route c not like these other rappers they be lying on beats the warden of the west is who i happen to be built to survive we always had that grit fight on because we wasn't made to switch Faithful to my hood, I can't switch. The Aina is the reason that I'm rich, that I'm rich, that I'm rich. Yes, sir. Music yes. is something like that, yeah. Mahalo Punahele. Whoa, so much fire. So much fire. Look at the chat going off here. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, these answers are just so enriching and just really speak on what I think a lot of us know a lot of us um feel maybe don't know how to express it so having you all sharing your work and having your work out there for us really inspires us to maybe even dig deep and maybe try to write some of our own or just even putting it down on paper like you said Punahele. i think i love that you said putting it down and getting it out there is yes um it could be a mechanism for us to voice our frustration but also healing that's beautiful thank you for sharing that um, we do have a question in the chat that I'd like to share with all of you, and I'd like to start with you, um, Katana, if you don't mind sharing, opening us up for this. Um, a couple of speakers gave apologies ahead of time in case someone may have felt uncomfortable with their words. And um, and they under this person saying, I understand as part of our culture, we never want to offend or hurt anyone. But I'm curious, and this is the question, how far are you all in your journeys of not apologizing for your spoken word and art forms? And it reminds me of Hanani K. Trask with such powerful, inspiring words and unapologetically Kanaka Maoli. So Katana, do you mind opening us up with that? How far are you along with not sure. apologizing? <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I chose to open up with just preparing our elders with what they may hear, just in case there are any that are, that are you know, listening. Um, for me, this is just, it is very much a part of me and, and my self expression. And I really don't apologize for what, you know, my truth that I speak and what it is that I feel and what it is that, that I think. Um, so, yeah, I mean, along the lines of what, you know, uh, Kumu Haunani K. Trask would say, right, being Indigenous is always political. I'm very much aware that the words that I speak are always political. You're never going to make everybody happy with it, but I, I for myself, try to share these perspectives because I know that there aren't a lot of people putting together um, the impacts of Asian settlerism and Micronesian hate um, and the privilege that you know Asians bring to many institutions in Hawaii and the oppression that others feel with our presence. And so for me, it's important to speak these words um, to try to just expand the conversation and like just push um, thinking a little bit. And 
I don't know, I just, I don't make any apologies about that, but culturally I am a part of this genealogy in the Pacific. So I'm always going to prepare my elders so that give them a chance to not listen if they don't want to listen. Mahalo Katana. I completely resonate with that. Um, being a woman in my culture, in the Samoan culture, uh, being modern, there are times there are things I would just want to just blast off to some of these, you know, some of the elders that speak, but I am, again, I am cognizant of my surroundings of my cultural background. And, you know, again, sometimes the cultural background can be inspired or motivated by, you know, colonial mindset sometimes. Um, but at the same time, it's like, you wanna share your work and, you know, at least sharing that some of this may, you know, offend you. Some of this may be something you don't wanna hear. And at least you're giving them the option to either opt out or just be prepared to uh, hear some words that they may not be ready to hear. But how about any other artists out there? Any of you are, would you like to share what your journey is as far as um, not apologizing for your work or what you're about to share with an audience? Anyone wanna weigh in on that as well? Uh, I, I'll share a little bit because um, I have very little to share. Uh, like I said before, um, I haven't really shared my poems at all. A lot of my poetry and a lot of my work is sitting in my book because I've never really, after years of sitting in my book, like I only found a safe place to share it once, maybe. And then from that, I got two more times to share it. And this is the second one. And that's because like, I think I apologize today because I couldn't read the room. <laughs> this is Zoom. <laughs> Whereas if we were in person and I could see that, oh, everyone, you know, we're all kind of like-minded. I can feel that energy and I can, you know, hey, they look like me. I, I can, I can feel safe in that space, but also I apologize because I can't see anybody else except our beautiful panelists and um, yeah. No, I like that. I, I like that. I, I think that answer is also interesting as far as like, when do we, um, I think for me, it's like, when do you get to a point where you're going to just share, you know, so, so I guess following through, following up on your questions, Zaya, or your answer is if we were in, you know, in a face-to-face -face experience event and you saw that you were in a room with nothing, with no other Pacific Islanders and you were just in a room with, you know, non-Pacific Islanders, how would you respond? Would it, would it make it difficult for you to be as powerful as you were through Zoom? Would you, how would you navigate a space like that? That's a tough one, but <laughs> I think like the first thing I would do is call upon my ancestors and just mm. say, you know, I need your help because they need to hear this as, as much yeah. as they don't want to, as much as they won't like it, they're never gonna, you know, they're never gonna see outside of their white privilege because yeah. it's not affecting them. And yeah. I would just, you know, I wouldn't back down because that's a challenge that was set there right. for my ancestors. It's like, you know, you have this message and you have this voice that we've given you, you better use it. And uh, I would, you know, I would do it. And then right afterwards, you know, I take a good look and walk away. Like, no questions, please. <laughs> Does anyone else want to share their experience as far as, go ahead, Punahela, please. Um, but when it comes to music, I, everything I do, like, because before I used to just record songs, freestyle them on the spot, write them, record them toss it out, but I, I kind of realized that I was making mistakes that way. So now everything I write, I kind of brush over through with a fine tooth comb and I perform them for like my grandma or elders in the community, because I know that if I can win them over with my words, I can I can say anything. Um, and yeah, Tupac said, as long as you, um, you speak from your heart, you can never be wrong. And you know, it kind of goes to show that uh, I made such huge mistakes and terrible things. And like, I, my heart is so full of regret in life in general that I, I'm not afraid to say anything because no matter what I say, um, cannot hurt as much as the mistakes I made. Um, oh, I had some other stuff to say, but yeah, like I'm not, a, I'm not afraid. I don't know, I'm too, too just stubborn. Um, 
<laughs> and why not? Um, you know, uncomfortability. Like I performed in front of the military and I have said like, F the military and F your poverty drafting, stop targeting my community. Why is ROTC mandatory inside of my school at the time? And they look at me and some of them are just filled with rage. And some of them is like, what the, what are we doing? Like, who is these kids that we're targeting? What have we done in their homelands and in their communities? So uncomfortability helps us all grow. So just do it. And yeah, that's all. Thank you. I guess following up on that, Kunele, have you faced, um, have you had that same, you know, maybe pushback from Kanaka? you know, from maybe members of your own community. I know as a Samoan, sometimes when you say things, oh, it comes back to bite you, but, you know, have you had that pushback and how do you navigate that? Oh, definitely. I think um, a lot of our unspoken struggles, you know, everybody tells us, keep your struggles quiet. Like nobody else needs to know. But um, I yell at a lot of Hawaiians and the, the reason that like, I don't want to be a jerk, like, oh, I love our kupuna. But my grandma told me, just because they're older, no mean yet that they are elder. You know, some people are just old. They're not, they're not just because they're old, no mean they all get wisdom. They still low, low too. And yeah, it takes a while. Sometimes you gotta challenge your your olders, not your elders, your olders. And you know, you gotta you gotta help them see that there's it's not only their way or the highway. We gotta, you know, there some is like. Like, I love tradition, but sometimes, like, you know, the, if you hold clinging on to the patriarchy or, like, you letting religion isolate you from your lahui. And, like, oh, I love religion and whatever, but still, like, we got to gotta make room for everybody to be included because ain't nobody free until we all free. Um, and it's the return of the Makai Nana. Everybody, like, be chiefs in the Hawaiian community. Nobody, like, getting the lepo. And until we all get inside the lepo and crank and pull weeds into our back so every day i don't think great change will come amen thank you so much for that Punahele. beautiful beautiful exactly lots of and i see that in our in our you know i mean i'm sorry to keep referencing the someone but that's just the ancestral background that i can relate to there's a lot of want to be or like a lot of want to want to chiefs but no one wants to do get in the dirt and do the nitty-gritty the hard work that really serves the, the scope of our community and our, and our Pacifica community. So thank you so much for sharing on that. You know, um, how about any of our artists out there? Have you ever had pushback from your own communities when you're trying to share, you know, the truth with them, right? The knowledge that you have, that you've educated and you've, or you've researched and you've learned. Um, I've had the same pushback in my own family, you know, learning. So we're talking about religion. And uh, when I learned that there were gods before you know, the Christian God came to Samoa and I asked family members of my own about that. Like, I didn't even know this existed. And I got immediate pushback, you know, like don't ever mention God before God, you know, don't ever mention about the gods before the Christian God came because we were in the dark. And this is from my Samoan side. Have any of you experienced that pushback, whether it's religion, whether it's politics, you know, um, cultural identity, can any, does anyone want to speak on that? I know that's a tough question, but um, but we can always come back to that as well. I do have one more talking point. I know we're running down on time here. Um, that if anyone, and this is to anyone whoever wants to answer or share work to, as a response to it. Um, can you share how some of your work um, has helped raise awareness around the issue of uh, blatant discrimination against Micronesians in Hawaii? And I think of some of you have already done that, but uh, maybe like what do you hope to see more of, especially coming out of the pandemic? You know, what do you hope to see happen in our communities, local communities here in Hawaii, as far as raising awareness to on the discrimination here in Hawaii against Micronesians? Again, sharing a little bit about my background working at OISC um, as an intake worker at OCCC. It was very disheartening to see so many, not only uh, Micronesians, but just Pacific Islanders in general coming in, Kanaka Maoli, Samoans, Tongans, um, my different Micronesian um, backgrounds coming into the, the jail. And then not only facing the discrimination in the jail, not getting the translation services that they required, um, and then seeing them in the headlines, the, how they're portrayed in the media. Um, you know, how, what do you hope maybe coming out of the pandemic, if there is any, that you hope to see in our communities and maybe like, you know, where can 
our audience learn more about the work you're doing as well. If you can, you want to share your social media handles um, in the chat with our audience so they can follow you all as well. So I could share a little bit. Um, when I first shared that poem, like I, I wrote it, or when I first wrote that poem, I wrote it with Hawaii in my mind because that was what the, that was what the commercial was. It was about, you know, um, continental people, Americans wanting to go on vacation and to Hawaii. And but the, the way that I think this can in that that poem in particular and and um also a lot of our work here together is uh parallel like to micronesian and and like all the oceanic experience it's if i wasn't if i didn't state my background if i didn't say my ancestry who i was and i shared my poem everyone would automatically you know, identify with it, you know, locally here in Hawaii, like we all felt that. And that I think itself speaks to, and then if I mention my, my ancestry afterwards, that speaks to our parallels and it speaks to our connections. And even though it's not necessarily a good thing that connects us, it's just another way for us to stand together and for us to work together and reconnect because we all face the same problems. And um, as we're, you know, Apeli Haofa said, we're not, we're not, a, you know, an island, or we're not an ocean full of, I can't, I'm sorry, I forget his actual quote, but we are a sea of islands. That's the thing. We are connected by the ocean. We're not separated by it. So let that help us move forward together, hand in hand. Mahalo, mahalo there. Does anyone else want to speak on that or share their perspective? Or I do have another question that I'd like to pose if no one wanted to speak up, speak right now. Okay, so this is specifically to Punahele and Katana. Um, as Polynesians, Micronesians, and Melanesians, have you all ever had pushback for sharing your art form in hip hop as, as a form of hip hop? Um, have you had any have you had any pushback from our own culture, um, like from the Indonesian cultures or from maybe like African American cultures, because you're using the form of hip hop as sharing your um, work. That can go to Punahele or um, Katana, whoever wants to share first, if you want to. Sure. Um, I, so I'll, I'll jump in there and then I know um, my brother Punahele probably has a lot to say on this, but I'm going to kind of answer a little bit of all the questions because it it kind of rolls into this right so with the question of whether i've gotten pushback from my own community for presenting in the way that i do um so i understand that very much you know i am a asian presenting female uh, i have a japanese last name um and what hit me really hard today is when zia said you know i am my colonizer right so i am i knew because my, my ancestors went through a horrific period of enslavement and rape and human trafficking at the hands of our Japanese colonizers who are also my ancestors, right? Um, and so I've, in my experience growing up as a hip hop artist, where I have faced the most silence has actually been from um, male MCs, number one, just because I'm female, um, so I think Punahele and I probably had a very different um, perspectives on this. And you'll hear me talking a lot about just uh, in my work of just um, combating like the male gaze um, on, on, you know, women and on history in general. Um, but there's been a lot of that kind of tension locally with male MCs in terms of not wanting to, you know, hear what I have to say. Um, but again, I don't apologize for my work, right? So I keep moving on. If it's not for you, it's not for you. Um, and 
I got into hip hop originally with my brother. So my mom is Italian with, you know, African heritage. My brothers are actually black presenting. Um, so hip hop back in the back, you know, the seventies and eighties, right. That was a way for them to reclaim culture. Um, and so, uh, and that was a source of pride. So I grew up rapping with my brothers, um, they were break dancers. Um, they they would freestyle, they'd beatbox, and I just kind of naturally did that. Um, and I've had to realize, you know, through the years, walking through these institutions hand in hand, being being a female that is Japanese presenting and having brothers that are black presenting, that our experiences are not the same. They're not. So while hip hop is something that speaks to my soul right? Um, hip hop is something that I feel like I connect to ancestrally as somebody who is of oceanic heritage, because we have strong traditions of oration, somebody who is of Inuit heritage, we have strong um, histories of oration. And I can tell you in my genealogy, right, in those lines, we do have histories um, connecting us uh, to Melanesia and to Africa, right? So while I, from that perspective, right, uh, while I feel connected to hip hop, and then from my lines directly from Africa, right, I feel a connection to hip hop. But at the same time, in the American context, I do not have a black experience, right. And it's and so if people if if uh, if people that are black don't want to hear my work, I that's something that I can completely respect. Um, hip hop is something that I approach respectfully at and as anybody. At, where, where I would, you know, anything is that you always have to kind of know your people. So genealogy wise, I understand my connection to hip hop and I understand my distance um, from hip hop. And so I just, I, and so anybody talking to me about it, I try to be very upfront about that. And it is, you know, for me, it's a constant push and pull of being Aboriginal, of being diaspora, of being colonizer, being colonized, um, of, of, of uh, having a history, um, you know, to being enslaved and having a history to to the strength that is and beauty that is in the continent of Africa, um, but also carrying a privilege, right, and carrying Japanese privilege in Hawaii, um, and so all of this is kind of going on in my art form, and that's kind of like what I talk about. Um, so do I get pushback? Yeah, you know, sometimes. I can, you know, dig it. I can tell you when I was at the Steve Harvey showcase, first thing I did is I walked out into the audience and I got booed. And then I just started doing my thing and I, I ended up winning over the audience. Is that always the case? No, but I don't do this to please others. I do this to please myself um, because I just feel like I'm born to do this. And uh, quite honestly, it's this weird thing in me where I have these words and stories going on inside me and I just got to express it, right? Um, and so I'll do that whether there's an audience or not. And so um, if that people connect with that, great. And if they don't, this is just kind of something that I've always done. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of my perspective on it. Mahalo. Punaheli, you wanna weigh in on that? Yeah. Um, first off, I always uh, give credit to black Americans as the creators of hip hop. I'm just a guest in our house, even if I have ties. Uh, I, I give it up to them. This is your art farm. And eventually, like the more I learn in my own, uh, and the more I start uh, picking back up our traditional instruments, I'm transitioning to, you know, make more Hawaiian music. But um, until then, uh, I'm ready for battle. Anybody at any time, just because I, I come from that era of like Makuana, you you like take me out of this, then let's let's prove it. Bring your sword and let's swing it out and we see who's the best. And, you know, as Mapuana can say, you know, she's won probably a hundred, hundred times more than she's lost. And the same is for me. I'm down. I, I like prove myself. I love competition. And you're going to make me quit. And anybody who's ever tried to like get me out has not succeeded. So, um, but yeah, I always, you know, give reverence, honor, respect to Black art forms. And as far as Hawaiians, um, pushing back to me, uh, Hawaiians know, even like 
huh, a lot of elitist Hawaiians and there's levels of Hawaiians. There's back to blue Hawaiians. They know not to like get crazy with me because I will spit a verse at you and I don't know how you're going to react. Most people like, I don't think they can handle what I, what I get for bring to them. And, but I'm always ready. And I, I'm always, that's my aloha to them is to spit flames on them however I can. And yeah, that's it. Mahalo so much for all of you for your, your very important work and the words you've shared today. Um, I, I know we're running out of time. So we do want to thank our audience for joining us. Um, we have a couple more minutes, but I just want to first say mahalo and fa'afetai tere lava to all of you, to you four for, for joining us tonight. So much wisdom, so much power in your words that you've shared with us tonight. Um, you know, and then to our audience, thank you for joining us. You know, we are incredibly honored and look forward to hopefully seeing everyone soon in person for more events in the new year and that we can hear all of your work in person. Just, just, I mean, if I was affected like that on Zoom, I can't even imagine how I'll be in person. I'll be bubbling and crying in person as well. But uh, we thank all of you for those who have attended all of our events over the year for this, for this specific series, which was exciting and so very much needed. I am honored and blessed to have been in this seat as moderator and a big mahalo to our poets, to the Honolulu Museum of Art for this incredible partnership over the past year. Um, we look forward to seeing all of you in the new year, um, but please stay safe and enjoy your holidays with those you love and Maia um, Monuia. So in closing, I'd like to turn over the mic to our interim director um, for the Pacific Islands Development Program, Dr. Mary Therese Perez Hattori. Thank you so much. Sizus Maasi, Vinaka Vakalavu, Mahalo. Thank you to everyone in our audience, to our partners, Taylor Chang, Sarah Fang, and the Honolulu Museum of Art, a co host for this poetry series in collaboration with the East West Center's Pacific Islands Development Program. Mahalo to Lua for your great moderation tonight. And I want to share deep gratitude to our poets for standing and speaking in solidarity against the rising discrimination and the diminishing aloha for Micronesians in Hawaii. Your poetry resonates strongly and provides pathways for people to open their hearts and minds to challenging ideas like our complex personal histories that contribute to social disharmony and discrimination. As a daughter of Greater Micronesia, a native of Guahan, one who has been working with and advocating for social justice for Micronesians in Hawaii for many years. There are times when this work of advocacy is dispiriting, not just for me, but for my Micronesian and Pacific Islander cousins who strive to raise awareness and fight against discrimination. The words and wisdom, the honoring eloquence of our four, four poets and the presence of everyone in our audience has been uplifting and energizing. I am inspired and reinvigorated by all of you. These events lift our spirits and provide pathways to multicultural understanding and appreciation. Aligning with the vision of the East West Center and Pacific Islands Development Program, a vision of advancing a peaceful, prosperous and just Asia Pacific region. Let this event, let these poets and their words and voices be a call to action to each of us to stop the discrimination, to stop tolerating racist jokes and damaging speech, to speak out against all forms of racism that we see in our societies, in our homes, our neighborhoods, our schools, and our workplaces, and uplift those who are marginalized. Let us all work together to create a society where peace is built with justice and justice is guided by aloha. Thank you and mahalo. Mahalo everyone for joining us tonight. Be safe and have a safe holiday.